They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Disse-lhe João, Mestre, vimos um homem que o teu nome expulsava demônios, e nós lhe proibimos, porque não nos seguiu. Jesus, porém, respondeu, Não lhe proibais, porque ninguém há que faça milagre em meu nome e possa logo depois falar mal de mim. Pois quem não é contra nós, é por nós. Por qualquer que vós der a beber um copo de água ao meu nome, porque sois de Cristo, a verdade vos digo, que de modo algum poderá a sua recompensa. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Father, I thank you for Neville. Father, I thank you for his passion for you and his passion for your word and his uh, passion to, to teach your word to others. Father, we thank you that you're going to use that to speak to us even through some of these challenges, passages this morning, uh, given wisdom, discernment and guiding by your spirit. And Father, as always, we ask that you would open our hearts and ears to hear what you have to say to us through him this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What a hard passage, eh? But it made me think about the time I met someone. Well, I went for a bit of mission training with a Christian group called Horizons. I think they're now called World Horizons. And the session I most remember it was on the, the first evening. There was this American guy. I remember his name was Joe... Uh, I must have been about 23, I guess he was about 28 or 30, so only a little bit older than me, but my word, this guy had a, a solidity and a maturity about him. Uh, I remember a couple of things. I remember he had this trendy shirt with writing down the sleeve. I'd never seen a shirt with writing on the sleeve before. It was years after that until I got one. Um, but the thing that really struck and stuck is the way he talked about the future. His view of the future, the un understanding of the promises of Christ and the warnings of Christ about the future life and how that impacts life now. He was living differently because he understood what Christ said about the future. You know, there was another American called uh, was it Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that there are Christians who are too heavenly minded to be any earthly use. Well, maybe they were quite shallow Christians. If you're talking about a real Christian, if you're talking about this guy, Joe, that's a cheap jibe. Maybe a fake mindset. Uh, maybe there's such a thing. But people who really have their eyes on heaven, they're the most useful people to God here on earth as well. And they're being fruitful for the kingdom of God now. So... I was reminded about this because of the way that Jesus mingles in words about the future in with this very demanding 
uh, challenging stuff about how we live now, these moral and ethical demands, that this stuff about the first shall be last. Well, in the future, everything's going to be turned around, and that should change the way we look at people and treat people now. When he talks about someone having a reward, even for sharing such a simple thing as a cup of water, my, how that should change the way we look at um, thankless tasks. Are they thankless if God is going to reward something so simple? And, of course, the very serious the graphic warnings about hell that we heard from Jesus' mouth. You better believe him if it's Jesus saying these things. We better ask him. Say, Lord, I want some of those rewards. I want to be changed by you, to have the motivation in me that, yeah, some of those rewards will be mine, that I'll be nearer the first than the last. Please, may I not be like way at the back because I promoted myself in some fancy way down here and missed out on the deep rewards to come. No, may I have those rewards. But dear God, please keep me well away from those dangers that you warned us about. So, the start of the reading, I overlapped a little bit deliberately with what we looked at last week. Jesus talking about going the way of the cross. And the disciples do not understand what he's saying. And they don't ask. How come they don't ask? Usually they ask. They didn't understand the parable of the sower, so they asked him about it. But this time, it's like we don't want to go there. We don't want to know. I think they knew they would not like the answer. They don't like what Jesus is saying about where he's going, and they don't like what that implies about where they go if they follow him. And they know. They know they're not yet seeing things Jesus' way. That's why he's teaching them. Because that's what he's doing. He's teaching his disciples. You see, he's passing back through Galilee. He's on this long journey now. Uh, he's had the preparation time around Tyre and whatnot, and he's coming back down through Galilee. And the, the Gospels tell this is his final journey. He's going to Jerusalem, where he's got that appointment that God has given him. And he's warning them what's going to happen. But the disciples, they don't want to know. They know he's... He's got a whole different outlook. And so instead of having public ministry at this point, he's teaching them. But what have they been talking about on the road? They've been talking about, well, he asks them. He asks them, what were you arguing about? I heard some, I heard some agitated conversation there. What, what was that all about, guys? Once again, they've got nothing to say. They were arguing about who was the greatest. So let's try and be generous. Maybe that was prompted by the thought, if Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to leave you one day, they'll think, okay, who's going to to keep this this movement pressing on? Who's going to set the direction and the goals and say, well, what are the priorities? If Jesus is leaving, who's next? Who's up to lead this little band of ours? Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe the dynamic was affected by the way Jesus had chosen Peter, James and John for that exclusive glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, although he didn't permit them to talk about it. And the others must have been saying, what happened to you three up there with Jesus? And they said, look, we'll tell you later. He said, we can't talk about it now. So that must have been needling people, plus the contrast with the nine who stayed down below and had that experience of failure. They couldn't cast out uh, that deaf and dumb demon from the boy who was having all the seizures and it needed Jesus in person to come and cast that out unless they were going to put time into praying. So whatever was going on, clearly the discussion they were having about who's the greatest, it hadn't gone in an edifying direction. Shall we say that? And they didn't want to tell Jesus about it. They were not choosing the way of the cross. So Jesus tells them off. See, it it sounds very deliberate, very intentional, serious, conscious. Jesus sits down and he calls all the twelve. Come on, even you who are in the kitchen, come on. I need you all here. And he makes this eye contact. It's a very awkward moment, isn't it? 
They're getting a bit of a telling off from Jesus. And he says, look, who wants to be first? Who wants to be first of all? He's got to be last of all. That's how you get to be first. That's how you get, that's who's the greatest. The one who puts themselves last. And the one who makes themselves a servant of all. And whose own path is that? That's the path that Jesus is taking, right? He himself is leading the way. Uh, In the book of Hebrews, it said he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. See, he's letting his view of the future shape the way that he goes now. We read in the famous passage in Philippians about how he emptied himself of his glory and became human, became a servant, obedient even to death on a cross. And now God has raised him up and has the the name above all names. Jesus knew there was glory coming. So because of that view of the future, he was able to bear with what God called him to do. He who goes through the way of the cross will be exalted. That's for Jesus and that is also for each one of us if we will follow the way of the cross. And he says there's going to be this great reversal. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. And chapter after chapter, he's going to teach this again, sometimes slightly different words. The first will be last and the last first. The the life to come, things are going to be turned right around. And that future view, that solid view of the future will help people to change their behaviour now because he's not happy with their behaviour. And they're not happy with the behaviour, otherwise they could talk about it to Jesus instead of just keeping quiet when he asks them what's really going on in their hearts and coming out of their mouths. And why do the Gospels keep on revisiting this theme? It is going to come up yet again. It's because it's written for us. It's not only that we see that these were 12 shallow men. It's because we have the same flesh and blood as these 12 shallow men. We too need God to teach us again and again. We too, I too, still get it wrong. There's a natural human desire to be appreciated and, I mean, a lot of people, we've been thanking one of the leadership team already this morning and we do, we do express appreciation to one another and that's nice. And we go beyond that. We, we don't only want to be appreciated, we like to be applauded. We like to have those real massive pats on the back. We like to be applauded. We like what Jesus calls us for, the praise of men, for other men and women, human beings, to be the ones giving you honour. Jesus says, look, to shape your life properly, go for the praise of God, not the praise of other people. You value You value what people can say, who you're connected with. Even if you visit another church, who do you talk to? Do you like to meet the pastor? And there's nothing wrong with meeting the pastor. The probably pastor likes to to meet visitors. You know, if I've been preaching, I like to meet those who are here as well. But, you know, do you want to say, oh, I met the pastor, so-and-so? But who else did you meet? What about the people who sat next to you, sat near you at the back, the quiet ones? Ones with no particular status or standing in the church. The ones who appear to be nothing special in human eyes, but are they more special to God? Or at least equally special to God. The quiet ones, the ones with no money, the ones with no not wearing any finery. Remember who Jesus said to invite to dinner? He said, make sure when you're having people around for dinner to invite some people who, you know, won't be able to invite you back. They're the people that are precious to God, the people who can't return a benefit for you. At this point, he sees the need for a visual aid. He looks around. I guess because this is a family house, they're just passing through Capernaum, but I guess Peter and Andrew's family or someone lived there. And I picture at the door there's, there's a little toddler there, perhaps with his mum. And he said, oh, do you mind? Come on, come in. And he said, come on, little... And this little boy or little girl, uh, whoever he, she is. Oh, what's your name? 
Yonatan, ah, yes. You, you know your name means the gift of God. You really are a gift of God. And he embraces this child in a, a personal way, not just you know, using a person as an object lesson. But it, it's personal. It puts his arms around him. That's the meaning of the word there, the bent elbow. He welcomes the child. And he says, look, if anyone welcomes a child in my name, he welcomes me. What does it mean welcoming someone in Jesus' name? That's quite a nuanced phrase, and it may mean different things from one verse to another. I think here it means if you welcome him like I do. If you value a little insignificant person because it's what I would do, you're doing it in my name, says Jesus. If you do that, you receive me. You're not just receiving that person, making him or her welcome. You're making me welcome in your life. Whoever welcomes me, Jesus Christ, welcomes not only Jesus, but also welcomes the Father who sent him. So by doing a simple thing, by valuing and recognising, treasuring an insignificant, a little person with no status, and children had even less status in, at that time than they do now, right? By receiving, by welcoming, valuing one of God's little people, we value him. We receive God. He says, you, you receive me. You've got the greatest treasure there is. You've got everlasting riches. You're a person who knows God. Not just uh, having a pocket full of uh, a few gold coins or whatever that you have for a while and then they're gone. You can't take them with you. You've got everlasting treasure. Knowing me and God the Father who sent me. Of course, this idea is an idea that Jesus expanded in a parable in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, where he says, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And he'll divide people on that basis, whether they really treasured the people that Jesus treasures. So what we're getting at here, Jesus is talking about present day, like moral teaching, how we should teach each other, but it's a view that's informed by the future and fed and motivated by having an eye on the life to come. The idea that if we value the people that we're going to see in future, God values those who've not been promoted or didn't appear to be anything special here, but God valued them. How I need to value them now. How having an eye on the future, you see, leads to love and humility now. Love that is humble and a humility that is loving. And that's fed and magnified by having an eye on the future. Seeking praise from God and not praise from people. Let's have a quick look at this passage and uh, we can read it in English as well as Portuguese. This bit where John says... um, Lord, I tried to stop someone who's casting out demons in your name because he's not following us. Now, I don't know if John's looking for validation at this point. They've all been given a bit of a put down. Is he thinking, uh, well, at least I got something right? Uh, I, I did a bit of enforcing that was good? Or maybe he suspects he's slipped up on this one as well. You know, Jesus had a nickname for James and John. Uh, Mark mentions it in chapter 3 when he comes to that list of the disciples, the 12 that Jesus called. James and John, whom he nicknamed Boanerges, which is uh, Aramaic for the sons of thunder. <laughs> oh, but it was a son of thunder here. Yeah, yeah, you, oh, you, you can't cast out in Jesus' name. That's what we do. We 12, we're part of his band. Yeah, who, who are you? Jesus told him off. He said, you're wrong in, in at least three ways. You're wrong because if he's casting out demons in my name, and presumably being successful, he's not going to be turning against us. Don't we want to have people who are on our side in this country where things are getting dangerous? So what are you doing trying to stop someone who's also latched on? He's believing in me. He knows that there's power in my name. Why would you stop somebody else? He'll be on our side at least for a while. And then he says, look, whoever is not against us 
is for us. John had this outlook. I tried to stop him because he's not following us. Where did this us come from? The question is whether someone's following Jesus. This man, not part of the close, intimate band, but he's following Jesus. He's using the name of Jesus, recognizing that Jesus is the one whose name makes the demons tremble. John thought, well, he's not one of us, but... No, Jesus says, you got it the wrong way around. If he's not against us, he's for us. And there are jokes, aren't there, about when people get to heaven and we say, oh, there's a wall around. And so why is there a wall? Oh, because no, for them to be happy, they have to think they're the only ones in here. <laughs> and people make that joke about the Catholics, but we can all have a bit of that. We want to be the only ones there. And Jesus is trying to correct that right at the start in John's outlook. And he talks about the fact, look, people are going to be rewarded by God. for Whatever they do in my name, even if it's the most basic act of Palestinian hospitality, to share a cup of cold water on a hot day to a thirsty person, that simple, tiny, commonplace act done in my name, that gets a reward. How much more anything significant? What about someone casting out a demon, doing you know things worth talking about as acts of service? God will reward whatever's done in Jesus' name. So once again, a heavenly perspective leads to valuing other believers, not excluding, not thinking we're the only ones, but valuing anybody else who follows Jesus from a different tradition, in a slightly different way perhaps. And now we move on to the long bit at the end of the passage, which is fearsome, isn't it? These, these warnings from Jesus, warnings of hell. Now, I don't know literally whether these did follow on on the same occasion or whether these sayings have just been collected together and Mark wrote them down at this point in the narrative. What does matter is that Jesus said these things. Unquestionably, these are from Jesus' lips. Jesus. Gentle Jesus, loving Jesus, gave us these strong, terrifying warnings about hell. The first picture is about someone having a heavy stone put around his neck for a quick drowning. And he says that that would be better than what happens to anyone who causes someone else to fall. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble. Um, From the Greek word, we get the word scandalize. It has this idea of being somebody else's downfall, causing them to fall. I think the church Bible has causing someone to lose their faith in me. You might initially think, oh, well, that's about... Uh, grooming gangs uh, and uh, that kind of behaviour but it's much broader than that like anyone who by their hypocrisy and hard heartedness in church, if, if anyone in church puts off one of the little people even the young people who might believed in Jesus and they get put off by pe- people by whatever acts of speech or behaviour Jesus says there's a hard time Come, if you've taken away someone's seed of faith, that's a terrible thing that you've done, let alone those who actively lead people into sin. Drowning's too good for them. The implication is that something worse, something far worse than a quick drowning, awaits people who've done that. Then we get these serious words. Well, I'd I'd better read it again, hadn't I? Jesus read it three times. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And he repeats that picture about the foot or about the eye. And when he talks about going to hell, there's a particular word here, it's an Aramaic word, Gehenna, uh, and that's a place name. It's a place name. If you look on the map of Jerusalem, you can see there's the valley down 
uh, below the, the city walls, there's, there's a steep bit down in this valley, and people filled it up with rubbish. That's what they did with rubbish in Jerusalem, just chuck it into the valley of Hinnom, Gehenna. And the, the mold was down there, and the, the, the maggots and things, the, round, round all, you know, every month of the year, all through the seasons, these maggots were there. And it would be smoldering, a smoldering fire reducing the volume of it a bit, a fire that never went out. It's a, it's a revolting image that people would be thrown into that. It's a terrifying thought. It's not completely original to Jesus in the language that he uses, especially this bit about the worms that eat them do not die, the fire is not quenched. That's actually right from the very ending of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah has got so much gospel in it. And the final chapter is talking about the kingdom of God being opened up to all nations and people coming in, uh, but also those who have rejected God, facing the terrible judgment of God. And this, basically that is the quoting, that's that's the closing note, that's the final words of the prophecy of Isaiah about these worms that never die and fire that never goes out. And it'd be hard enough if Jesus had just used this picture once, but he repeats it three times. Now people debate about whether it literally means everlasting punishment. Does God punish people forever? And there are people who do the Bible study and they come up with this reason and that reason to read it in a different way. And if you've taken a serious look at it, Uh, and you find that uh, an honest and a helpful way to understand the Bible that just means people get thrown away uh, and then you don't think God punishes people forever on the basis of Bible reading, then, well, may may God give you insight. I mean, I find it easier just to take what appears to be the plain meaning of this prophecy from Isaiah that Jesus repeats uh, he probably repeated it three times. That's why there's missing verse numbers. Uh, the manuscripts differ according to whether Jesus actually repeated that bit as well three times. But the overall message he did repeat three times. He said it so emphatically. And the point of what he's saying is be ready to maim yourself. As Paul was making a joke about me. I haven't actually brought a saw to cut your leg off. It, it's... It's a picture, isn't it, about being ready to cut something out of your life. We probably don't literally uh, remove body parts. But he said, look, be ready to maim yourself. Think about it. Cut something out of your body. Talk about the Paralympics. I mean, the Paralympics are in the news, and it makes people think with nuance about disability. Because some people think of disability as worse than death. You know, oh, I'd, I'd rather you know, not survive a car crash than come out of it uh, crippled. Better to die, isn't it? And some people who are disabled uh, don't have that point of view. They say, no, it's very much worth being alive with a disability just because I'm not exactly the same as everybody else. What is bad, what is the worst thing about it is the inequality, the, the difficulties that we have in society. And obviously there's a lot of nuanced discussion about that at the moment. But they're both saying, look, there's nothing worse than this. And Jesus is saying, there's something much worse. There's something much worse than any kind of suffering in this life, whether it's physical disfigurement or whether it's humans treating you badly. There's something much worse that is coming for some people. The idea of the punishment of God. And it's terrible. So he said, look, do anything to avoid that. Cut out of your life whatever would endanger you. Cut it off. Pluck your eye out even. Maim yourself. Even things that are good. I mean, hands, eyes, feet, they're they're good, aren't they? It's good to have hands, eyes and feet. God made them for good. Uh, But be ready to cut out from your life what might lead you into sin. We might think about sexuality, that very powerful human desire that in all of us is broken in some way or another and it needs to have limits put around it. 
But there's all sorts of other things, even just watching TV might normalise um, unbiblical views of, of, well, of sexuality. Okay, let's say that again, uh, that, that it's just normal people do jumping in and out of bed all the time. Computers uh, can be very helpful. The internet has quite a lot of good uses to it, but we all know there are dangerous things on that as well. Um, social media, you know, can be great to keep in touch, but it also can end up with peer pressure to do things that are honouring human opinions much more than honouring what God thinks. We could go on and on about things that some people need to cut out of their life. I mean, Jesus found it possible to, to drink wine and other people find it better to give that up. The point is that whatever desires, aptitudes, whatever... It, instincts we might have they're not necessarily good instincts and Jesus says look where are they taking you seems to be the assumption in society these days that whatever instincts people have that should be expressed that should be lived out and that's the point of humanity to satisfy whatever desires we have and Jesus says no fear the consequences Fear has a bad name, doesn't it? You know, fear used to have good consequences for society. You know, why do we have so much shoplifting now? Why is shoplifting such an issue? People used to have a fear of God. People would steal when they were absolutely desperate. Or perhaps a few people out of bare-faced cheek. But by and large, you know, the, people don't believe in God and so they don't believe there's any punishment from God and so the, that doesn't put them off stealing something from a shop and well will the police come if I steal it you know police people complain don't they police used to come when someone was stealing and you can't get the local bobby run you could only get the local bobby to come and attend when someone was stealing something from a shop when shoplifting was rare if it's happening in every shop every day it's just not possible for the police to attend is it It started with losing that fear of God. And now, if there's no consequences, people act with no restraint. Ah, People say, ah, why are you worrying about shoplifting? It's victimless crime, isn't it? Well, it's victimless until the shop can't stay open anymore. And we've got shops shutting because they, they they can't stay in business. They're losing so much. Fear used to have benefits for society when some kind of fear of God was widespread. Only, but even if society has given up on fear in God, Jesus says, look, fear still helps us. Fear helps us. Because there's so much at stake here. He talks about why would you cut off your hand so that you enter life? Why would you cut off your foot? Why would you pluck out your eye? Why cut something enjoyable and apparently nice out of your life? For a healthy fear of ending up in God's place of punishment instead of in God's place of welcome and blessing. Come and enter life, he says. Twice he says, enter life. The third time he says, enter the kingdom of God. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is something that in Jesus' time and in our time is, is now and yet it's, it's also not yet. The kingdom of God has started, but the kingdom of God has not fully come until Jesus returns. And when he does, we want to be in that place where Jesus is king and there is no more opposition or uh, affront to him anymore. We want to be in that place where his praise goes on and on and where we love him and love one another. We don't want to be among those who've chosen these various ways of, of sin, of stumbling, of falling away from God. So a right view of the future gives us a, a warm view of the riches of knowing Christ, of knowing God, and looking forward to the rewards. But also it's only right, and it's certainly part of Jesus' teaching, to have a healthy fear of the punishment that awaits others.
So let me end with one of these little sayings he, he has at the end about salt. Stay salty, he says. Verse 50. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? You think, well, salt, salt is just salt. It's sodium chloride. Yeah, but they, they didn't sort of mine pure salt in those days. So the salt from around the Dead Sea would have a mixture of uh, chemicals in it and the actual salt, sodium chloride, might be leached out and you'd be left with the gypsum and other stuff. So, you know, it made more sense in that situation for salt to lose its saltiness. And he says, look, your life is meant to be salty to God. It's meant to be tasty. It's meant to be appetising to God. But if you lose that that niceness, if you, if you lose that, if you if you despise and choose to mix up the purity of the life, the holy life that God is giving you, and you, you want to spoil that, to adulterate it with other things, how can you be made salty again? No. Let's have a heavenly mind. Let's have a heavenly mind, mindful of the promises and the warnings of God. Mindful that we're, we, we're keen to stay tasty to God. May we have a heavenly mindset that makes us and keeps us humble and loving and open to others and holy. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy on us. No wonder the disciples didn't get you. We, we, we still don't get you. We have difficulty with these words and some of this is terrifying. But Lord Jesus, thank you. You are the one who came to redeem us. You chose the way of the cross because it's the way of victory. And you have had the victory over evil. Now you will cast out evil from our lives if we only come to you. Oh Lord, give us your spirit. Come and work in us. Help us to keep an eye on the future in such a way that we don't become no earthly use. No, just the opposite. May we become very, very fruitful people for you because we know the one who has saved us. We know who the, the one who's taken us home and we live for your praise above any praise of mankind. In Jesus' name, amen.